He's keeping track. Okay, so Debbie wanted me to explain that, that uh, the flowers that she got, Nancy painted those because she wanted to brag on Nancy's talent. So there you go. She wants me to announce that there's youth group tonight. So I think I just did that. So here we go. I don't know. not my department so uh, let's see where were we so I, I do want to say thank you for your appreciation and um, you know next August will be 30 years that we've been here and um, it has been it has truly been the great blessing of our lives to pastor this church and and um, I was remembering uh, probably wow 20 years ago I was in. I was at a conference in the Portland area, and I bumped into a, a, an acquaintance from college, and um, who's also a minister in Foursquare. And and we were talking, and and uh, we'd been here ten years at that point. And he said, "Wow, you've just been over there suffering away in Toledo for a long time." And I was like, "If you only knew." You know, if you knew how great our church was and how great it is to live in our community, that you would, there'd be pastors lining up for an opportunity like the one I, I have and live with the people that we minister with. And and I really do feel that way. And even 30 years uh, has gone by or, or roughly, and, and here we are, and uh, it really is a great joy. And uh, more than ever, I, I think it just is getting uh, better and and more relaxed and so on. So I, I did want to say that, and I, I'm sure Debbie feels that way too. Um, today I want to talk about nature's testimony. And and I'll be looking at some different scriptures. We'll be in Romans 1 in just a little bit, and Psalm 139 as well. But I, I was thinking about the testimony to to God's glory that nature provides us and, and the implications of that in our lives. Because there are important implications in terms of how we respond to the Lord, how we respond to others, um, how we recognize what God is doing in the lives of human beings. Now, you know, I, I would preface that with saying we understand we don't worship the creature or the creation. We worship the creator. But that's the point of nature's testimony. That creation is a testimony. It testifies of the glory of God and who he is. And, and if you're not careful, the world will steal that testimony from you. That, that a lot of times people in, in the faith become nervous about admiring the glories of creation because people who would deny God turn to creation as their answer. And, and the point is, God did this. It's his handiwork. And, and even as I was thinking about that, that when Debbie uh, showed me the, the flowers just now that, that Nancy had given her and that she painted it, uh, when, when she says, Nancy painted that, and you look at it and you say, that's so nice, you realize that's a testimony to Nancy, not to the board with the flowers. And, and when you look at art, when you look at craftsmanship, when you look at things that people accomplish, you recognize that. And I'll, I'll say a little more about it, but it is a testimony of the creator, the, the, the person who creates whatever that is. And in the same way, all that is around us is a testimony to the Lord. And the people that you're in the room with is a testimony to the Lord. And every time you, when you think of the joy you have interacting, when you look at the, the marvels of humanity and, and you begin to realize it's a testimony to God. And so we, we want to look at that, um, 
that by admiring what God has created, we are confessing that Christ is Lord. And I get a personal kick out of that because when you when you realize that, you know, we read in, in the scriptures that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord. But when I hear an atheist telling me how beautiful creation is, they're already doing that. They're, all, they're worshiping God and they don't even want to admit it. And, and you know, I kind of get my jollies that way. Um, and, and so it's the same with God. Let me read from Romans 1.20. It says this, From the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly observed in what he made. As a result, people have no excuse. And, and there's so many things in just that, and, and I'll dissect it as we go along. But um, I want to start with the unique qualities of mankind that stands out in creation because God did something with human beings that he didn't do with any other creature. But I think of God's in, invisible qualities being observed through all that he has done. And, and you can learn a lot about a person if you look at their craft. And in the same way, you learn so much about God if you look at what he's done. And, and you've heard me joke about it before. How many believe, how many know by observation, God's not a perfectionist, right? Yeah, you know, you look in the mirror, you might notice God's not a perfectionist. Uh, but God doesn't have perfectionistic issues. The grass doesn't grow at the same rate of speed. Your flowers aren't perfect. There's something, God doesn't have those hang-ups. And, and, and by the way, God doesn't have, apparently have a problem with dirt because the earth is made out of it. And, and so were you, right? Or certainly Grandpa Adam. And, and so we, we think about that, that, that God is different in these ways. But when we think about the unique qualities of mankind, and I think it's important because I, I was thinking in the book of James, and, and we'll deal with some of it uh, next week because some of you may not want to be here next week. I'm going to talk about anger. But, um, you know, it makes you angry that I just said that. But, uh, but in, in the process, I was thinking about that passage of Scripture in James that says, you know, blessings and cursings should not come out of the same mouth. These guys are already making plans to be gone. Um, the blessings and cursings should not come out of the same mouth. And, 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 and then it says with, with the tongue, we, we, we praise God, and then we curse man who's made in the similitude or the likeness of God. And these things should not be so. And, and when I think of the glory of what God did when he created man, that, that man is a marvelous work of God, that in that discussion we have to be careful with what we say and how we respond to other people. And, and one of the reminders that, that I think is so good for us to always have is if you just knew that person's story. And, you know, context is so, is so revealing when we, when we think of the context of people's lives. If you knew the person's story, you wouldn't be so critical. And uh, I, I, I think of that, you know, the, the phrase, if you knew what was going on, you'd actually know what was going on. And, and every once in a while over the years, someone would say, I, I can't believe that person's acting like that. And, and all I can think of is in, in my mind, well, if you knew the story about them I knew, you wouldn't care. It wouldn't matter because you'd know their story because context is everything. And, and uh, so we, 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 as we look at what God has done in people, and the very people you're in the room with and the people you live with, your family, even the ones that, that kind of push on your rough edges a little bit. If you knew there's, if you thought about the glory that they are, the miraculous nature there, uh, you, you'd appreciate who they are in, and who God has given you more. And so we think about babies, right? When, you, when you're young parents and you're having, you know, particularly I think of your first child, if you have a lot, you know, some of you moms are, are crazy. So, you know, by the time you have your last child, it's like you, no big deal. You have a baby and go have a cup of coffee, but um, probably not. But your first one, you worry a little bit, right? And, and so uh, you remember those moments. And, and what's the first sound you want to hear? 
And what's the last thing you want to hear the rest of their life? But isn't that the sound of life? Isn't it the sound? And, and, and you know, we're, we're often, we'll remind uh, parents, you know, they worry their kids make a little noise or they cry, and, and it's like, that's the sound of life. That's the sound you want to hear. And, and I remember that when we, 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 early on, we were getting the building, and, and uh, the, uh, the, the, there were some kids playing outside, and they were right outside my office window, and, and I was deep in, in spiritual thought at the time, of course, and, and because I always am. You know that about me. But uh, they, they, were, they were right outside my window, these little girls, and they were just playing and chatting and just going on, and I couldn't focus because so, it was pretty entertaining. And so I was listening to them. And, and it didn't bother me because I heard the Lord say, that's the sound of life in a church. And, and I believe that's true of all humanity not just children. And, but somehow we forget that. That uh, when we look at children, they're, they're, they're little and they're sweet and they have that cuteness and, and it's easy to appreciate who they are. But children grow up to be people, right? And then we look at them differently. And, but God doesn't. God doesn't. And, and I remember... Um, when I was driving, I was hauling chips, and I was driving uh, up 101, hauling, driving my chip truck, and I saw this uh, this gal, um, and uh, she was a mess. You know, she was haggard, and, and uh, she clearly had a, a drug abuse issue, and, and all these things uh, walking down the street. And, and uh, in that, when I looked at her, God, through in the Spirit, showed me this this happy little girl dancing. And, uh, and I looked at this, this woman that was caught up in, a, in, in sin and being destroyed with her life. And I saw that and I asked the Lord, when did she stop being precious? And he said, never, because she is to me. Think about it. That when we look at each other, could we see one another through God's eyes? That, and, and I would tell you that because maybe you don't see yourself that way. Do you know that in God's eyes you're still precious? That when you look at this, an innocent child and you think how sweet they are, God views you that way? And you might say, but, but Charles, what you, what you have to understand is that, that, you know, I'm not innocent. No, but you're justified by faith because you're washed in the blood of the Lamb. And so when God looks at you, he sees the purity of Christ, which makes you look innocent. And, and you continue to be precious. And, and I was thinking about mankind, and of course, I like to, you know, I don't know if I like it or if I just do it, but I, I think I like it too, is I look at things from a behavioral scientific point of view because of my education in psychobabble. But um, I, we understand, we, we have difficulty explaining the human mind. We, we can explain the brain, and, and that's the first thing you have to understand is there's a difference between the brain, technically speaking, between the brain and the mind. The brain is the physical organ of flesh that is inside most of your heads, hopefully, right? That is that organ that we use to function and think with. The mind is what's happening inside that organ. The mind is you. It's your soul, your psyche, your personality, your thoughts, all those things that are happening. Now, we know how the brain works, but we don't completely understand how the mind works. And, and, and so you can say, well, the brain, you know, it's, it's a balance of neurotransmitting chemicals and electrical charges and, and, and neurons that fire and transfer these thoughts. But what we can't explain is poetry and music and mathematics and, and, and love and tenderness and, and beauty 
that's something that's in the mind. And it's just not part of the physical structure of the brain. And, and so we, you know, when you talk about people struggling over their beliefs regarding, you know, God creating man versus man evolving, man, if man evolved from, from lower life forms, why does he have something that they don't have? How do you explain this, this, you know, how do you explain that music is moving? How do you explain that, uh, that someone could read poetry and their heart is touched? How do you explain the, that, that what we call heart feeling that you might have? And, and as people, we, we will go someplace or see something and we'll admire beauty, we'll admire history, we'll admire stories, we admire things. And, and, and how, if you have pets, I'm pretty sure you've noticed your pets don't. You might even notice your pets don't admire the clean house quite the same way you do. Yeah, you, you notice that. And some of, uh, I just saw, I just saw a lady reach over to her husband and says, you're such a pet. But I, I don't know if she meant it endearingly or not. No, I just made that up with 42% of the other statistics. But uh, we, we, there's something miraculous as God has woven man together and created his inner beings and inner workings that we can't comprehend. And, and I think of that in Psalm 139, 14. It says, I will give thanks to you because I have been so amazingly and miraculously made. Your works are miraculous and my soul is fully aware of this. And, and, and I always see that in two different th- ways. And, and the older King James says, marvelous are your works and, and this my soul knows very well. And, and, and I think of that. And the first thing I think of is I wish more people understood that they were already made very well. I wish more people could understand that they are already a marvelous work of God. That, that you know, sometimes we're, we're so busy trying to become a marvelous work of God, we forget that we already are a marvelous work of God. And according to Scripture, that happened in the womb. It's something God did when he created you. And, and, and the, uh, another scripture uh, I want to look at, and because we see the connection between the two, is Genesis 2-7, when God breathes life into man. And it says, Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth and, bl- and blew the breath of life into his nostrils. The man became a living being. And, and when we look at creation, that's, that's unique about human beings. That if you were to read uh, up a little bit, if you went back into creation and you read uh, a little bit, you'd find out that the animals were also formed from dirt. But they didn't get the breath of life. It, it just says they were formed from dirt and became living beings. But when he gets to man, and remember what God said, let us make man in our image, our likeness, our similitude. And, and, and when we look at that, when he makes man, he forms him. But before he becomes a living being, God breathes the spirit of life into him. And, and that explains the mind. It explains the nature of man that's different. It explains the desire to worship. Because God puts something of himself in us. And it makes life valuable, doesn't it? And, and, and so we begin to think of things in, in that way. And, and man unique, man's unique qualities testify of God that, that about that wonderful breath of life that he breathed into us. And, and I think of that because, you know, if we're not careful as Christians... We can get caught up into this arrogance of thinking we're, we're better than other people. And the truth is you're just better than who you used to be. It's not that we're better than someone else. It's that we're better than who we were before we started walking with Jesus. And, and you know that's true. 
And, and, and as we think about the, this, these qualities, I've witnessed in people, when you watch people, of they have a false faith. They worship false gods or, or they have no faith and they deny the existence of God. And yet, they have this amazing quality to love their children and to value honesty and to try to do the right thing. And they still, there are people who don't believe in God that still have compassion and they, they still have a love for the beauty of things in life, and, and, and they honor nature. They, they see what God has done, and they're struck emotionally by it because the image of God was put in them. Now, I think, of course, we think they, there's no, by no other name is there salvation than the Lord Jesus Christ, and they need to come to him. But when you see people, you, you will find what you're looking for in them. You will see either the image and miracles of God working in them or you will see the bondages of hell that trap them. But you will find what you're looking for. And I would say look for the things that bring honor to God. Look for the things that bring honor to God. And, and, and so we see that humanity is a testimony to who God is. And, and so we, we get this and, and we begin to think about, well, where does mankind's love for nature come from? Did you know it's something God created? And, and granted, you know, sometimes you feel like you, you're competing with people's love for nature, right? On, on the Oregon coast where, you know, we get like 70 inches of rain a year. On a nice Sunday, you, you feel like you might be competing with people's love for nature a little bit. But, um, but in the process, where does that come from? God put it there. God put it there. And, and, and you talk to people there, go for a drive, and, and like Debbie has a favorite place when we're when we coming, you know, on that, that new road. When you get a pine, she can see everything and see the trees, et cetera. Um, she, she thinks that's amazing and thinks about the Lord. Um, where did she get that from? Where did that, where did that desire to am, admire what God has done come from in people? Because animals don't seem, you know, animals don't seem to have that. Have you noticed? Where did that come from? And if you if you pause to consider you know, these issues surrounding ecology, conservation, sustainability, you'll discover that these concepts are not new. And, and I begin to think about that because sometimes the church thinks it's at, it's at war with people that want to take care of the earth, and, and we shouldn't be because the earth is God's. It's his. It belongs to, you know, it belongs to the Lord, right? How many knew that? How many love what he has done? Exactly, and, and, and I was thinking about that as I, because I was thinking about some historic things and, and that a love for nature and a desire to preserve what God has done is not a, a new thing. You know, if I was thinking about many people over, even over the past 200 years that, that were concerned about uh, harm to creation. And you can go back even a little further than 200 years. If you think about... Uh, this is, I think it's interesting. It doesn't matter if you do because you're not preaching, I am. But um, if, when was the first book on, on forestation and managing forestation written? 1662 by John Evelyn. And, and so you go back to 1662, here's a man writing a book on how to preserve the forest. Where does that come, and, and I don't care where you stand on those issues politically because politics is irrelevant in the first place, but um, you know it is, right? Because the kingdom's eternal and politics aren't. So when we're talking about kingdom issues, politics become irrelevant. And, and so it doesn't matter, you can stand where you like on that, that's, that's your issue. But what I'm saying is, where does that love and desire to preserve what God has done come from in humanity? That's an important question. Isn't it? 
And as we go back and we look and, and we realize if you, you know, and you can go back further than 1662. If you read the Old Testament, you will discover a love for nature, particularly if you read the Psalms. Don't you discover a fascination with all that God has done? And, 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 and you begin to think, where does that come from? In fact, I think it's the arrogance of our current age and time to think that, they've, that conservation is their idea. I think it's arrogant that we live in a time when man thinks that no one thought of preserving creation until they thought of it. Because people have been concerned with this for a long time. And it, man has long loved what we call nature and its beauty. Throughout history of the known civilization, humanity has adored and sought to preserve that which God created. That's a testimony to God. Did you know that's a testimony to God? And even when man has not wanted to worship God, he has worshipped what God has created, which testifies that God is real. It, it, and, and it's this whole process. And so where did it come from? Uh, God put it in us. It was created in mankind to love and care for God's creation. And if we read in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, and what I'd like to say, I know this is kind of a weird sermon for me, to be honest with you. It's a lot easier to smack you around a little bit and send you home. But um, for whatever reason, this is what God laid on my heart, and we're stuck with it. But um, in Genesis 2, 15, it says this, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to farm the land and to take care of it. And in that moment, God created in man a love for what God himself had created. That every time God takes an act and every God, time God speaks a word, he creates. It comes to life. It becomes a law. It becomes a reality. So as soon as God says to Adam, your job is taking care of the garden, there is birthed in man a love for nature. Now, I know there are things about nature that aren't as lovely. Uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever thought of that. But, uh, you know, most people I talk to at some point, they like watching some of those nature shows where you see all these things going on. And, and, and I think some of the nature stuff we watch we, we think is really neat because we have television, not smell-o-vision. You know, because nature smells like nature. And sometimes that's good and sometimes... It's not, yeah. And, 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 and so I get that, but, but when we think of God put it in us to want to love and value nature, and, and, and so when God places man in the garden to tend the garden, he creates in man a love for what God has made. And we are still seeing evidence of that even in people who despise the name of Jesus. Because though they would despise his name, they cannot escape that which he put inside them. And, and that should remind you that God is real and he's living and he's powerful and he's significant. And, and it, it should bring in, up within you a desire to praise and worship him. And, and so if we look at it, and, and the God's Word translation puts, you know, says you're there to farm it. And, and if we look at those Hebrew words, um, actually, if I want to I go back just for a minute uh, and reference us being made out of dirt and the animals being made out of dirt, because um, in Hebrew, it's two different words. So the animals are made from the soil, all right? Man is made from the waste of the soil, and that's in, so animals are made from better dirt than human beings, according to the Hebrew text. What makes man special? The breath of God. The breath of God. And, and so you, you, you might think, well, well and, and, and I think that's significant because people will look at themselves and they'll think, well, I don't have a lot of, you know, natural gifts. I don't have a, there's not a lot to use. You know, God didn't give me much to work with here. 
why did you think it's funny when I pointed at myself? And you really think that's true, don't you? Yeah, I can tell. It's all right. It is. God didn't give me much to work with here, and I get that, but the reality is that's not relevant to what God does through you. God's power isn't limited by your limitations. And so when we think about, you know, animals are made from better dirt, better soil than than man is made from, but man is better because God breathed into him. And, and there's another passage in Scripture that says we should never compare ourselves amongst one another because this is unwise. And the reality is it doesn't matter what your natural giftings are. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter how smart you are or how smart, how dumb you think you are or any of those issues. None of your limitations limit what God will do through you because he is breathing the breath of life in you every day. You're not limited by your limitations because God has none of those limitations. And and when we think of the scripture, it says in our weakness, he is made strong or in in reality, his strength is manifested in our weakness that those very limitations become a testimony to the power of God as he moves through you. And so, so we begin to think about that. And, and now I'll come back to the, the man is put in the garden and he's told to farm it and to, to care for it. And, and it uses this Hebrew word uh, to, to describe it, which is abad. And, and, and the word means to work it and serve it. To work it and serve it. He says, you know what? You're going in the garden. You're going to work the garden and serve it. And we begin to realize that, that in that, God creates this sense of connection to the rest of creation. That you, you work it and you also minister to it. And, and we see that in the scripture. And, and, and it doesn't matter. You say, oh, Charles, you're preaching on ecology. No, I'm preaching on the Lord and all that he's done. Don't get lost in some earthly issue. That when you see people wanting to work in and serve and minister to our planet, to this earth, you have to know what God has done when he wove them in their mother's womb. You have to know as you look at the beauty that is around you that God wants you to worship him. It's a call to worship And so we, we think of that, and, and um, lower life forms don't ever do this because this testifies of God and who he is. And, and so I was thinking man has no excuse because creation testifies of the creator. And, and that's, the, that's the other side of things when we say, well, well how is it that... You know, how's God going to judge people? That's a stupid question because you'd have to be God to comprehend it. Every once in a while we say, well, why does God want to do this and why does God want to do that? Well, I could try to explain it to you, but since you're a human being, it's kind of a waste of our time to talk about how God's going to do something because his ways are higher than yours and his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. It's much like explaining calculus to a two-year-old. Or 40-year-old. But we don't think God's higher than us. That's why we always want to judge his point of view. We always want to wonder why he's doing, you know, we think God should give us a reason for his thoughts and plans and judgments. Why should he have to? So we come to this issue that man has no excuse. And, and of course, in the, scientific, the natural science community, it, it, it comes down to the struggle of intelligent design that they, you know, there are those that don't like those, the word, the phrase, intelligent design, because, the, it, you know, it implies intelligence and a designer instead of chaos. But every time we look at something that's created, that's of beauty, we know there's a designer, 
And, and you you think, well, what are the odds? You know, like let's say that you um you took you had a bunch of uh, river rock, and and somewhere in the river rock there were also agates mixed in, which happens sometimes. And um, and you're gonna you want to cover the uh, front area of your yard with some river rock, and and there's agates in there, and and you think, well, what I'll do instead of organizing anything, I'll just throw them up in the air. And when they fall down, all the agates will be arranged in the shape of my address. Now, why are you, you don't think that's possible? How many, how many don't think that's possible? Okay, some of you didn't raise your hand, uh, which indicates you think it's possible. So you're weird, but anyhow... Um, and just to clear that up, it's probably not possible. How many times do you think you'd have to throw these rocks in, in the air for them to fall and allow the, the few agates in there to spell your address? Like a Google of times, right? Just, just. That's a number, by the way. Google is a number. And, um. Yeah, but it's a number. So if you Google Google, you're going to find out Google's a number. Um, yeah. There. <laughs> any, any, it, quit distracting me. In, anyhow, um, I'm easily distracted, so stop that. And uh, in any case, uh, we, we, we begin to think about that. You think millions, millions. The odds of that happening are, are astronomical. They're basically zero. It just couldn't happen. So what are the odds that creation could exist without a creator? Zero. That's the point of intelligent design. And, and so when, when you, you know, like if, I don't know how many people love old architecture. I mean, I don't want to live in it, but, you know, I, I, because I did once, you know, my parents had a home that was built in 1900, and which has its cool things about it, and except when it's cold outside. But um, you think of the architecture, and you walk around and look at old architecture, and and and, and you you begin to notice they they tried harder than we did. You ever notice that? You look at the moldings, and not mold moldings, and you look at some of the carvings and the columns, and and you notice that people of yesteryear worked harder to make things beautiful. There was design. And, and you'll look at that, and, and, and like one of the things I like a lot is stained glass. And, and I remember when we were in Paris and we were all looking at some of the stained glass. And, and, and you, you look at this beautiful stained glass, and, and you don't think it just fell like that. You immediately see it and know someone did that painstakingly. That's a pun right there. By Painstakingly put each pane in. And, um, and worked that in and made stained glass. Made stained glass. And, and you, you have to stop and admire the people who did it. Because intelligent design in, in, in implies an intelligent designer. And in that way, nature implies God. And we must worship him. We must admire him. And I was watching a video you, Dave, just, just like a couple days ago, smelling a tree. So I'm going to tell the story because if, if you, it's out there, if you ever see it, um, he's not sparking it. He's, he walks up to this tree, and it's kind of funny. He's walking up to this pine tree, and he, he walks up, and he sticks his face in. And it's like, oh, he's lonely. He's lonely. But he's not. He's smelling it because it smells like vanilla. Now everybody's going to go smell pine trees, right? Is it just the Ponderosa that smells that way? As far as you know. Okay. It's a little creepy because there's not a lot of sound on the video. In, yeah. In, in all fairness, it's a little awkward because you see Dave walk up to this tree, smells the tree. It looks like he's kissing it. And then he turns and he goes, come on. So uh, that wasn't comfortable for me, Dave, but, um, but I knew what he was doing because we've had that conversation. And it smells like vanilla. 
that's a that's an interesting miracle. I have before, but there are no pictures of me doing that, so <laughs> I'm not qualified to say that I really did. But, um, but it, it they do they smell like vanilla. Isn't that a isn't that a charming thing that should make you want to worship the Lord? And um, but it, it it implies what intelligent design. And so Romans 1.20, from the creation of the world, we read this, I want to read it again. From the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly observed in what he made. As a result, people have no excuse. And that's where we're at. People have no excuse because everything around them testifies of the creator. And in fact, I had a, one of my teachers in Bible college was a scientist and um, and he taught science, and 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 he was later teaching. I had him for prison epistles, and and uh, one of my things uh, over the years is periodically I'll be talking to people, and I always get curious: How do you come to the Lord? And and his uh, his name was Morris, and and he said, uh, "Science led me to Christ. Science led me to Christ. The more I learned about nature." the more I understood there had to be a God. It wasn't, for him, it wasn't, it wasn't the church. It wasn't a neighbor. It wasn't someone else. It was, he saw in creation that which testified of God and he came to Jesus. That should inspire worship. And so we see God's invisible qualities are observed along with his eternal power and divine nature. And, and, and ultimately we realize this, man precisely ponders the concept of God because there is a God. It's not, you know, people say, oh, people created God in their own minds. Why would a man who evolved from a lower life form in the vacuum of the existence of God ever ponder the existence of God? See, that's a question no one asks or answers. But the reality is people think about ex the existence of God because there is a God. Because he does exist. And he's on your mind. And, and I've learned that over the years. People will say, I feel like God's telling me something. And usually, and, and the first question I might like to ask is, well, do you agree with him? Because if he's telling you something and, and he's disagreeing with you, that's a good chance it is God. You know, if you think, if, if God always agrees with you, you, you're not hearing from him. But if he's often disagreeing with you, then you're definitely hearing from him. Okay, because you're wrong a lot of the time and he's not. And, and, and that happens and, and I'll, you know, people say, well, well, I feel like I should do this or I feel like sh I should do that. What do you think? And my answer sometimes is the very fact that you are wondering this tells me that you're supposed to listen to him. The fact that you're, you're weighing it, that you're, it's on your mind, tells me that God's speaking to you about it, right? And, and in the same way, the fact that you wonder about God and who he is and what he's done is proof that he exists. And, and, and so these are good things. So we're going to wrap this up. He breathed, God breathed into man. And when God breathed into man, it sparked a living being that is connected by the very breath of God. And that we're connected to him. We have no choice. And consequently, man has always pondered the concept of God. As a result, people have no excuse. The other thing I've learned about pastoring for you know, close to 30 years. Well, actually, I have pastored more than 30 years because I pastored somewhere else. But um, the, the one the thing I've learned about it is um, people often say they don't think of things that they're thinking about. Right? And people will often say they're not convicted of something that they're completely convicted about. And they'll say things like, I never think of that. Yes, you do. And we know you do. And that, because that's the nature of man, right? The nature of man is to declare his own righteousness, which 
is the fallen nature. The, the nature of the divine is to declare the righteousness of God. And, and, and so we begin to see this, this point that man has no excuse. To deny God is to go completely against your created nature and purpose. To deny God is to go completely against your created nature and purpose. If you have ever admired anything he has done, you are inspired to worship. And, and we see that in, in people. They're, they're, they're stunned by the surroundings. And unfortunately, there are people who have been so programmed by our culture that they don't always let it lead them to God. And then there are those who won't let it lead them to God. One famous scientist um, won a Nobel Prize. Um, he put it this way. When he looked at the mathematic odds of, of, of nothing, something out of nothing, right? The mathematic odds of creation emerging out of nothingness. He said, when you look at the mathematic odds of this happening, you know it's ridiculous. But the alternative is unthinkable, so we stick to it. And the alternative is that God exists. And for him, because it, he'd rather believe the lie than the truth because he felt belief in God was an unthinkable thing for him. He stubbornly resisted the power of God to draw him to his knees. None of us want to be that person. The very blindness of foolish and darkened hearts of our day testifies to the existence of God. The very blindness. And so you think about that. How many know people believe in some really ridiculous things nowadays? And nobody seems to care. Right? It, it, nobody cares if you believe in Santa Claus. Even if you're an adult, they just think it's weird, but nobody cares. There are people that believe in aliens. I wasn't going to go there, but yeah. I didn't want to mention Bigfoot in case anyone in the room believed in. Uh, but, but, you know, there's that. There are all kinds of monsters and sea monsters and this and that that people choose to believe in and and nobody cares you can believe whatever lie you want to believe and nobody cares but if you believe in the truth of Jesus Christ people get upset that's a testimony that God is real it, you know if I if I told someone I believed in flying saucers they would just ignore me hopefully that's why I tell them that but um they would just ignore me, but if I said I believed in God, they would argue with me trying to talk me out of it. Why is that important to you if he doesn't exist? It's a testimony of his reality that people are upset about this. But see, why are they upset? Because they are under the darkness of the father of lies. They're in bondage to the father of lies, and Satan hates the truth. Romans, I want to read some more, because uh, we, we really looked at Romans 1.20. I want to read the following verses so we get a little more context here. Describing mankind that rebelled against the Lord. Starting with verse 21. They knew God, but did not praise and thank him for being God. Instead, their thoughts were pointless and their misguided minds were plunged into darkness. While claiming to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for statues that looked like mortal humans, birds, animals, and snakes. For this reason, God allowed their lust to control them. As a result, they dishonor their bodies by sexual perversion with each other. These people have exchanged God's truth for a lie. So they have become ungodly and serve what is created rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So when I read that, I think of this, that this passage describes the culture around us is evidence of the reality of God. 
And you, as I'm reading it, I know this is happening in your minds. So we're reading this and you're thinking, that's happening around us. You read Romans 1, 21 through 25, and you can see that man has been doing this. It's happening all the time in our culture. It's proof and evidence of God. You say, well, it seems like people have a reprobate mind. Doesn't the Lord say because they wouldn't retain the knowledge of God, he turns them over to a reprobate mind? It's proof of who he is. And then when you think that things are happening in, in the world today that are predicted in the scriptures, you have to begin to wonder, what is God doing? And even bad news becomes an opportunity to praise him. When you, when you look around and say, well, it seems like the Lord's coming back. Isn't that an opportunity to worship the Almighty because he was right and he's being proven right? Isn't, isn't that a reason for praise? The reality of God's judgment suggests the very reality of God himself. So as we conclude, we, we come to this understanding that everywhere you look in this world, you see a reason to praise God. Everywhere you look in this world. You can see, even when you look at man in his darkness, you see the judgment of God, which is proof that God exists, and it's a reason to praise him. And, and you see that. And, and part of it is we, we, look at, we look at the depravity of man and we think, how do we fix it? But the, re, but the question isn't how do we fix it, but how do we react to it? How do we respond to it? And the way I react to the depravity of man is, is, is through biblical knowledge. It says man will be this way and God has turned him over. And, and therefore, I know God is real and I must praise him. I must worship him. I must respond to him. From the complexity of human beings to the vastness of the sky, whether you look through a telescope or a microscope, you see God. You know, a telescope looks at things far off and a microscope looks at real little things. And, and whether you look at either one, you see the beauty and complexity of God. When you, you look at the complexity of a single-celled organism under a microscope or you look at the beauty of nature in a panoramic view through a telescope, you or the stars, you see God. God and all that he has done. It's a reason to praise and worship. Now, there will always be, as there have always been, until the Lord settles things, there will always be stubborn non-believers. It's there. It's a real thing. There's nothing I can do about that. Right? I can't fix them. I can't make them think differently. That will be the case. The day of the crucifixion, the thief Barabbas had a bigger church than Jesus had. I can't fix that. But what concerns me is how many Christians are going through life without noticing all that God has done and letting it inspire them to worship. Then when we come here, we drive, just because we live where we live in, in Oregon, we're surrounded by nature. And I forget that sometimes till people come.